Muy buenos días. Eh, estamos aquí en nuestro seminario Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución. Y es para mí un gusto muy, 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 muy grande tener con nosotros ahora como ponente al doctor Tiago Quental de la Universidad de Sao Paulo. Eh, el doctor eh, Tiago Quental eh, obtuvo su grado en Ciencias Biológicas en la Universidad Federal de Río de Janeiro. Después realizó una maestría en Ecología en la Universidad Estatal de Campiñas, en Brasil, y obtuvo su doctorado en Biología en la Universidad de Harvard, en 2008. Y eh, realizó un postdoctorado con el profesor Charles Marshall, también en la Universidad de Harvard, y luego otro postdoctorado, también con Charles Marshall, Marshall, pero esta vez en la Universidad de California, en Berkeley. Eh, Tiago tiene una carrera sumamente destacada en un área eh, del conocimiento en biología sistemática que vincula los procesos entre las especies vivientes, pero explicados desde un punto de vista de la, de la paleobiología cuantitativa y han publicado, eh, junto con sus colaboradores, una serie de artículos extraordinariamente importantes en el campo. Eh, Tiago eh, es, como ya mencioné, actualmente es profesor en el, en el Instituto de Biociencias de la Universidad de Sao Paulo y también es editor asociado de varias revistas muy importantes en biología, por ejemplo, Methods in Ecology and Evolution, es editor asociado de Proceedings of the Royal Society y eh, también editor de PLOS eh, B. También él recibió una distinción por su excelencia en la docencia en la Universidad de Harvard y como ya les mencioné, eh, sus artículos son muy relevantes y han sido publicadas en las revistas de mayor impacto. Por ejemplo, tiene varios artículos en Science, eh, también en Proceedings of the National Academy of Science y en Trends and Ecology y and Evolution. Eh, tiene eh, más de 6,000 citas a sus artículos publicados y entre sus distinciones internacionales se encuentran ser un miembro del Consejo Científico de la Society of Systematic Biologists y un miembro del de Comité Internacional de la Sociedad para el Estudio de la Evolución. Eh, sin más, eh, entonces doy la palabra a Tiago, agradeciéndote eh, de una vez, Tiago, por darnos esta presentación. Y pues adelante. Thank you very much, Susana. First of all, I want to apologize for not speaking in Spanish. Uh, I thought of trying uh, Portuñol, but I thought that would not go very well, so I decided to, to speak in English. I'm, 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 I'm sorry for that, but I hope uh, I will speak slowly and, and it will be easy for you to follow. Um, I would like also to start uh, thanking everyone for, for the organizers of the, of the seminar um, to invite me. It's a great honor uh, to be here and a great pleasure. A special thanks to Susanna and Marcelo for the invitation. And uh, okay, I think I'll just start sharing my, my screen here. And let's see. Entire window, share. I think it works. Um, and I'll go from here. Let's see. Okay, so that um, uh, the title of the talk is uh, using Kennedy fossil record to study how species interaction might affect origination and persistence in deep time. Uh, as I said, great thanks to everyone for organizing this. It's an, an amazing seminar series. I saw the website is incredible. I feel really humble and honored to be here. And as I said, special thanks to Susanna and Marcelo for, for inviting me. Oops, I'll be back. Uh, I'll, before I go, I also like to thank a lot of people. I mean, everything I'm gonna be presenting here today could not be done without the help of so many people. Um, first of all, I want to thank all my students, current student and past students for all their uh, insights. I mean, for their hard work, in fact, right? I mean, most of the stuff I'll be presenting here was actually 
done by by the students. I mean, I, I do like to get my hands dirty and do a lot of, of the analysis myself, but uh, the truth is that uh, the lab is run by the students. I mean, they do the hard work and, and they also always, I mean, a, a source of inspiration for me. So great. Uh, I really like to thank all the students in the lab. I'd like to thank also a bunch of scientists who have helped me in so many different ways throughout my career. But for the special talk here, uh, I'd like to thank Daniel Silvestro, Mark Juhin, Juan Cantalapiedra, Matias Pires, and Paulo Guimarães for their input in different things. Um, of course, I would like to thank uh, Charles Marshall for being sort of a long-term collaborator and friend and an inspiration as well. I'd like to thank my Universidade, Universidade de São Paulo and FAPESP for funding, and uh, all the people involved in the paleobiology database and the NAL database, both the people who organize those databases and all the scientists who have actually contributed data to those databases, which are absolutely um, an amazing enterprise, uh, which I would not be able to do the science I'm gonna present you today if this didn't exist. Okay, so, the talk today, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, trying to ask the question, is there a role for species interaction in macroevolution? So I'd like to start by a simple definition of macroevolution, which was given by Hauptmann in 2020, which uh, reads as evolution that is guided by sorting of interspecific variation as opposed to sorting of intraspecific variation microevolution. So if we take this uh, definition, basically, the potential role of species interactions in microevolution will translate in, into changing or affecting speciation rate, extinction rate, or phenotypic evolution. So the idea here is to discuss, do species interaction interfere or affect speciation, extinction rate, and phenotypic evolution? Uh, to be more precise, the talk today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to concentrate on the potential effects of species interaction in driving speciation and extinction dynamics. The first question that comes to mind, for those of you who might not be familiar with the, with the, with the discipline, is how do we infer the relevance of species interaction in diversification dynamics in, deep, in dynamics in deep time? A lot of people have, have done that. It's, it's no, no novelty what I'm going to present here. So I just want to give you a flavor, the different ways that people have approached this question. So people using molecular phylogenies, for example, can use trait-dependent diversification models where they can classify each species according to a different kind of species interaction and therefore use this information to try to infer something about uh, differential diversification rates. For example, here we see an example where um, this, uh, this scientist led by Samantha Price were interested in, in investigating if diet had an effect on diversification rate, and they do show that apparently um, herbivores have a higher diversification rate and onivores have a lower diversification rate. Another example using molecular phylogenies and trait dependent diversification models are uh, is this one here, a paper by Marjorie Weber and, and Agarwal, where the species interaction here is a mutualistic interaction between plants and ants. So uh, some plants, as many of you might know better than me, have uh, structures that allow them to, to establish those interactions with ants. So the ants protect the plants against natural enemies and the plant usually uh, offers some sort of, uh, uh, of uh, food resource for the ant. So here we have plants with extra nectars and plants without. And what this analysis suggests is that uh, Plant species that engage in this interaction have a higher diversification rate than plant species that do not. This has been evaluated by the presence or absence of extra follower nectaries. Now, scientists uh, in the paleontological literature or, or discipline have also been interested in the, in, the, in the role of species interaction in macroevolutionary dynamics. And, and they have done this by for example, as in this paper here led by Bissang Liao, characterize uh, how speciation and extinction dynamics vary through time. And in this example here, shown, for example, that uh, um, the extinction dynamics of bivalves are coupled with the origination dynamics of brachiopods. Those two clades are supposedly competitors. And what we see here is that when, a, uh, when this extinction rate of bivalve increases, um, it opens the possibility for brachiopods to originate more species. So there is a, 
so the interpretation is there is some coupling uh, uh, in the dynamics of extinction and speciation here, uh, where uh, bivalves, uh, in some sense, suppress uh, brachiopod diversification. Um, paleontologists have also looked uh, into more uh, indirect ways of inferring the role of species interaction, for example, looking by evidence for equilibrium dynamics, for example, showing that the number of species to some extent uh, enters a sort of plateau phase where there's an equilibrium in the number of species and that has been interpreted, for example, as uh, the outcome of interspecific interaction, niche feeling, and so on and so forth. So, um, and these ideas sort of emerge from uh, the co-option of the logistic growth model uh, adapted to a macroevolutionary scale. In this case here, we have now uh, a sort of carrying capacity, not of individuals, but of species. And eventually, interspecific interaction would perhaps be the mechanism, uh, the mechanism underlying uh, this, this um this uh, diversification model where as the number of species increases, the diversification rate drops and eventually the clay enters a sort of stable equilibrium in terms of number of species. Um, and we do have evidence for what, what I call here as diversity dependence uh, dynamics uh, in several groups. I'm showing you here two examples for dogs or canids and in some groups of foraminifera where we have direct evidence that speciation rates are negatively associated with number of species. As the number of species of the group increases, speciation rate drops. So that will be, uh, that has been interpreted as evidence for interspecific competition of rather sort of, sort of very indirect evidence, but still is interpreted as evidence for uh, the role of interspecific competition in diversification dynamics. I just want to point out another type of competition here, which has been mostly discussed in the paleontological literature, which is called the clade competition, which is slightly different from what I'm calling here self-diverse dependence. So self-diverse dependence is the diverse dependence imposed by the species of the clade of interest, of the focus clade, let's say dogs. As you increase the number of dog species, the rate of speciation of dogs decline. Clade competition is diversity dependence, but in a different fashion is the diversity of another clade. So let's say you have clades A and B, group A and B. A could be dogs, for example, and B could be phthalates. As the number of species of phthalates uh, rise, that could have an effect on dogs and the number of species of dogs decline. So there's a competition, there's diversity dependence operating, but not within a clade, but between clades. Um, in my lab, I have been very interested in the sort of dynamics of trying to use diversification models um, using the fossil record to infer, or at least in, indirectly infer, the role of species interaction more uh, precisely or more in particular of interspecific competition. And what we have shown uh, using carnivora as a model system is that there's ample evidence for diversity dependence within and between clades. Uh, so typically here I'm showing two, two um, the graphs for uh, diversification on the top, uh, on sort of dark blue, and then speciation extinction on the bottom, speciation in, in blue, extinction in red, where we see, like, maybe you can see my pointer here, where you can see uh, the diversification rate is typically positive and eventually becomes close to zero. And when we look at the, at the dynamics, the individual dynamics of speciation extinction, what this graph here is showing, this is a measure of an association is that typically speciation, both in Eurasia and North American carnivores, are negatively associated with diversity. As the number of species of carnivore increases, speciation drops. And extinction is positively associated with diversity in North America. As the number of species increase, extinction rate increases as well. So both, are, both uh, results are in accordance with this idea that there is a carrying capacity, there is a limit to diversity, and that limit we typically interpret as the result of uh, interspecific competition. When we look at the different clades uh, within carnivora, we see something rather interesting as well. So each dot here, either black or gray, is a given family within carnivora. We have arrows coming 
from a dot and coming back to the dot, like this red arrow here, or arrows connecting dots. So when we look at the speciation dynamics, are the two panels on the left, we see there are some dot, some arrows, red arrows that come from the from the from the from the from the family and go back to the family. That's self-diverse dependence, meaning as we increase the number of species, speciation of that clade drops. Uh, this self-diverse dependence only operates through speciation dynamics. It, it's, it's, we don't see that happening in extinction dynamics, meaning that self-diverse dependence operates through speciation, not through extinction. On the other hand, diversity dependence that happens among clades or between clades typically operate uh, through the dynamics of extinction. For example, here in, the, in North America, in the bottom uh, right uh, panel for extinction, we see that a rise in felid diversity represents or is associated with the rise in extinction rate of canids. That's all good. And we have been interpreting this as evidence for interspecific competition uh, as the mechanism behind either within or between plates. But uh, there are some simplifications here. Of course, we are not fully naive, but there are some simplifications here. The first of all is that competition does require spatial and ecological overlap, right? Most of those microevolutionary studies do not explicitly consider spatial overlap between species. I mean, we were not completely naive. So our attempt to consider spatial overlap was to look at the dynamics of one continent and then in another continent. So at least to, to minimize this idea that, oh, if a, if a species originates in Africa or Asia, it's not gonna interfere with the dynamics of the same clay in North, in North America or South America, right? So by carving out the species pool by different continents, it's a first attempt to, 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 to take into account spatial overlap, but might not be enough. The second uh, point is that uh, we don't directly uh, really take into account uh, ecological overlap. We just assume that those species might be competing. When we see evidence for diversity dependence, we say, oh, this is the mechanism underlying this is interspecific competition. Um, like on the other hand, ecological work done today can actually measure and see how much of the of the diet there's overlap between species, like in this in this example here with some failures. But microevolutionary studies do not explicitly consider ecological overlap or ecological similarity between species. We assume that. Um, <clears throat> So what I want to first present here is the work done by Rodolfo, where we try to go beyond this sort of diversity dependence models and try to more explicit uh, view the effect of interspecific competition. And we're going to be using Canids as a, as a model system here. So we had two goals. The first one was to develop a new approach to more explicitly evaluate the effect of competition, speciation, extinction dynamics. And what's new here is, is was we were trying to more explicitly incorporate spatial and ecological overlap. And then the second goal was to use this approach and the fossil record to investigate the diversification dynamics of Canada and try to infer if there is any relevance for interspecific competition on driving speciation and extinction dynamics. So for that, we used um, data from the paleobiology database. I mean, there's a huge amount of data available. There is also, uh, uh, we have to be aware that there's there's also has to have some sort of curatorial work because I mean all databases are prone to error and we have to spend a lot of time curating this data set. But after we did that, our goal was to sort of to develop a competition index, a time series like shown here in the bottom right, where we could measure the intensity of competition as time went by. And to do that, our idea was to incorporate or more explicitly incorporate temporal, ecological, and spatial overlap of species. So how do we do that? Oh, the temporal overlap or temporal coexistence is an easy, is an easy stack, easy task. We have been doing this for a while when, for example, we do, we try to fit models of diversity dependence. In this graph here, in this figure here, I have on the x-axis time, uh, each dark line, horizontal dark line is a species. So it's a point of origination and a point of extinction. And I can go in time, like this red, 
vertical lines and see which species were alive at that point in time, which species were alive at that other point in time, and go, for example, at every point one million years and describe which species were alive at that different point in time and have a sense of who was coexistence in time with whom. Spatial coexistence is a lot more trickier, as you see, but the, the data from the Polybrow's database, luckily there is information about um, uh, where the, the fossil species specimen is found. So there's latitude and longitude. So we, there's at least a chance for us to incorporate spatial information in the analysis. <clears throat> so we developed three uh, different uh, approaches to, to deal with spatial coexistence. And the, and, the, and the difficulty here is that the fossil record is incomplete, as you might know, but it's particularly incomplete in, incomplete in space, uh, meaning that you might have a really good fossil record in a given region, and then you move, I don't know, 100 to 100, 1,500 kilometers away, and the, and the fossil record is inexistent. Uh, so we have these three, uh, three approaches, which we consider three sort of metrics of spatial coexistence. I'm calling here the site approach, which is more conservative, but also in the sense that if you see two species together, they are very likely to have coexistence in the same locality. Uh, but on the other hand, it asks a lot of the data. And on the other extreme, we have the regional approach, which is the most permissive approach, which is basically to assume that every species in a single continent interferes with each other. And there's a, a rich approach, which I want to explain more uh, in detail, which is sort of intermediate with, with respect to how permissive it is and how much data hungry it is. So the regional coexistence, as I mentioned, is simply to assume that every species in a given continent, let's say North America, which was our case, has the potential to interfere with each other. So that's very broad. So the, the, the idea here is to have extreme scenarios uh, because the regional approach is, uh, is less demanding of the data, but more permissive. And the site approach is more demanding of the data, but more prone to the incompleteness of the fossil record. So the, the, the site approach, on the other hand, was to consider two species to coexist only if they were found in the same fossil assemblage, in the same locality. So if you, if you this, is a, this is an example of a fossil assemblage here, if you see two species in the same geographical spot uh, at the same time interval, then you consider those species to coexist. So it's very demanding, like for, in, in a sense that for you to infer that species A has coexisted with species B, both have to fossilize in the same place at the same time. <clears throat> the rich coexistence is sort of an intermediate approach where we have uh, at different points in time, we could use all the, the, the geographical information to sort of see if there is at least some overlap among the species. So there's species blue here with four occurrences in four different places and species orange here with five occurrences in different places. They, they are never found in this exact same locality, but there's a, some overlap in their distribution here. So that would be another way of trying to sort of an intermediate way of saying, oh, if there's some overlap, we're gonna consider those two species to have coexistence. In fact, we were a little bit more, um, uh, uh, less, uh, the, the, the method was even more um, permissive in the sense that we knew that the fossil record is so incomplete in, in, in space that we allowed also another kind of uh, metric to consider coexistence, which is this. In a given time interval, we measure the distance between those two points here, the, the closest point between two species. If this distance was smaller, equal or smaller than the sum of the largest distance here and the largest distance here, we would consider those two species to coexist in this metric. The, the, the reasoning here is that we are trying to use the, the, the biology in our, in our advantage saying, oh, this species was able to move that, that distance in, that, uh, in the short amount of time. That species was able to move that distance in a short amount of time. So if this distance is short, we are gonna consider those two could have interfered with each other. We don't see that because the fossil record is rather incomplete in space. So it's sort of an, so it makes a lot of assumptions, it does, but it's sort of an, an intermediate between site uh, and regional coexistence. And the idea is that we can use all those three different approaches uh, and see if our inferences are dependent or not on how we consider 
the spatial scale of coexistence. To um, have a sense of ecological overlap, we used um, uh, cranial dental measurements to for body size and diet. Luckily, this is really well established for mammals, where you can actually infer the diet, at least in a very coarse way, pretty well uh, if you have uh, several different metrics of the teeth. Here, I'm showing you a plot of a linear discriminant analysis for uh, extent species, when, uh, where we, which we know the diet. And you can see that the LDA1, the axis, the x-axis here, is pretty good at separating the different diets in, 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 in carnivora, in the, in, the, in, the fam in, the, in the order of carnivora. So we're going to be looking at diet in a very coarse way, defined by hypercarnivores, mesocarnivores, and hippocarnivores. There are no herbivores in Canada, but there are hypocarnivores, meso, and, and hippocarnivores. And there's also been well established that there's this very close relationship between the length of uh, uh, the lower molar teeth and, and body size for species. Again, we can use the, the, the extent species to calibrate this relationship, and we use that those equations, those regressions to estimate the body size of uh, extent species because we have the teeth of those species. So with uh, an index of carnivory and, uh, uh, and body size, we can sort of build this two-dimensional morphospace where each dot here or each square here is a species, and we can measure how close a species is to another species. So we can have a sense of how crowded the species is in this ecological, or, or I should say, morphospace, right? So the species that are really crowded, the assumptions here is that they'll be feeling more competition if they overlap in space as well. <clears throat> so we used two different uh, metrics. The first one was a mean pairwise distance, which is basically the average distance of all species that coexist in a given point in time. And the other one is the near, mean nearest neighborhood distance, where uh, we, it's an average as well, but only takes into account the nearest neighborhood. Uh, <clears throat> and the assumption here is that as the distance increase, the intention of competition, of competition decreases, right? So we using those three kinds of information, spatial, sp spatial, temporal, and morphological overlap, we sort of built this competition index as time went by. <clears throat> and using this, we use that to see if speciation extinction dynamics could be explained by or were associated with uh, the, this time series, which decri described the average competition felt by species. Not gonna go into detail, but we use a Bayesian framework that is implemented in the, in the software Pyrate. And I think what, the nice thing about it, I think it's worth mentioning, is that it explicitly incorporates the fossil record incompleteness. It estimate, jointly estimates preservation rate, speciation times, and extinction times and rates through time. And uh, in our case, we had a model where uh, speciation and extinction were potentially associated with a time series. So there's a parameter here with the gamma, which is gonna be measuring, is there an association between rates of speciation and the time series? In our case, the time series is either diversity or the competition index. If this value here of gamma is zero, that means there is no association. If this is negative, it could be negative or it could be positive. So what are our expectations for speciation? For diversity, we see, we expect an association between uh, a negative association for speciation and a positive association for extinction. As diversity increases, speciation should drop, and as diversity increases, extinction should rise. For the pairwise distance, it's the opposite. Uh, as diverse as the distance uh, decreases, meaning as species get closer to each other in morphospace, speciation should be smaller. And as, as, as the distance increases, uh, species are more further apart from each other, and the assumption they don't interfere with each other, extinction should be smaller. So we're going to be looking at this G gamma or G parameter to infer is there an association between diversity and, and rates or between um, uh, this index of competition and rates. So here are just uh, simpler results of how diversification varies through time. We have a phase in canids where there's a radiation phase where 
uh, diversification rate is very positive and eventually it goes closer to zero, meaning that it's sort of an equilibrium. It's not never an equilibrium, but then it becomes more negative. And when we look at the speciation and extinction separately, we see that the radiation phase is driven by a, a, a very high speciation rate that drops and then eventually extinction rate rises a little bit around 20 million years and then rises again towards the present. Here's just to show you each line here is a, is a species. So it's to the left is the origin of the species, to the right is the extinction of the species. First thing that comes out is this space, not an novelty. Uh, people have described this and discussed this a long time ago. There's a, a tendency for a species of candid species to become larger as time went by. There's a cope, it's called Cope's rule. But what's interesting here is that if you look at different colors here, the different colors of the different diets, this tendency to become bigger, it's happening uh, sort of simultaneously in the three different uh, uh, kinds of diet. And here is just to show you that we can sort of separate the, the three different diets. So it's just the same data, so only reorganized in the y-axis by the level of carnivory. So what are the time series that we get? So here's diversity through time at the regional scale at the reach scale and at the site scale. The regional scale is the total diversity through time. Reach and site are what's the average number of species that coexist when we look, when we use the reach metric and when we use the site metric. I mean, they are different, but there are some similarities among those. I mean, reach and regional are very similar. There's a rise in diversity and, and then some sort of equilibrium and then a drop. Here in the site, it's not as smooth, but there's still a rise in diversity and eventually there's a tendency to drop as well. When we look at uh, the statistical results, we see, so this violin plus here, if it's away from zero, meaning that there is an association between diversity and in this case, speciation rate. And what we see here is that this association, it's negative association as one would expect from, from diversity dependent models only happens in the oligocene in all three different spatial scales. So that suggests that diversity dependence operates through speciation, but not in the whole existence of candidates. It only, it only operates in the rising, in the radiating phase of the dynamics, which makes sense. <clears throat> and we can discuss this later, but it makes sense that it operates mostly here in the rising phase. <laughs> here are the results of the two different um, metrics that we use to infer the index of competition. Um, they are quite different uh, among themselves, especially among, uh, uh, not among themselves, but between MPD and MND have very different behaviors. I'm going to see why. When we use the mean pairwise distance, there is no association whatsoever with this time series and changes in speciation. And what I think is happening here is that when we use the mean pairwise distance, we are we averaging out every single species. So the, this average is, is, is losing the signal of the potential signal of competition. On the other hand, when we look at the, when we only look at the average distance to your closest neighbor, then we see evidence that would be in accordance with uh, interspecific competition at the same time interval as diversity seems to be relevant, at least for two spatial scales, the regional and the reach. For the site here, we don't see any evidence of a statistical association between changes in this index and changes in speciation. For reach and regional, we do see for the oligocene. So there's evidence that speciation dynamics might be affected by competition during the expansion phase, except at the site scale. And why we see evidence at those two scales and we don't see evidence at the site scale. So the more mechanistic uh, explanation makes sense because when you look at the, the time series uh, uh, in conjunction here, we see reach and regional are purple and blue here. And we see there is in the oligocene, there's a, is a big rise here and then there's a drop. So distance are further apart here. Oops, sorry. And they start, species start to become close to each other, close to each other, close to each other, close to each other. In the site, it's basically a plateau here when there's a huge rise here. And then it, apart from this spike here, they basically stay the same. So 
we don't know. I mean, we can speculate. Is this a biological signal or is this the fossil record quality signal? Uh, we don't know. So the biological signal would be, or perhaps when we look at the site, the process of interspecific competition is so fast that we cannot detect it at the site level. And all the species that last in the same locality needs to be further apart in morpho space when we measure the species at the more uh, broader uh, spatial scale. That would be sort of a biological interpretation. But on the other hand, it could be simply an artifact of the fossil. It's tempting to think about the biological uh, signal or explanation, but it's hard to eliminate uh, the fact that this metric here is more demanding with respect to, to, to the fossil record. If you don't catch a species in the same place at the same time with another species, you're going to say that they never coexist through the eyes of this site metric. So. We cannot really tell apart those two. <clears throat> Interesting is that extinction dynamics, there's no association with any of the time series. So extinction doesn't seem to be uh, affected neither by diversity or by this more uh, explicit metric of interspecific competition, the, uh, the disparity metrics. There's also interesting to note that uh, there's no association with temperature as well. Uh, so it, it, neither speciation nor extinction dynamics seems to be associated with changes in global temperature. Uh, and what's rather puzzling, for, might be rather puzzling for you, is like why, what drives this drop here in number of species? What drives the rise in extinction here in, 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 in canids? It's not temperature, it's not diversity of, the, of canids, it's not the, the, this, the, the interspecific competition within canids. And what we think explains this is clade competition with phthalates. So we see a rise in the extinction dynamics of canids as soon as phthalates immigrate from Eurasia into North America. So there is evidence for interspecific competition being relevant again and driving extinction dynamics, but it's not the interspecific competition within canids, but between canids and phthalates. So quick summary here. Diversity depends uh, seems to be present at all spatial scales, but only in one uh, particular point in time or a phase of the, of the radiation, only during the moment where the clade is radiating. Interspecific competition, uh, uh, oh, that's what I just said. Uh, diversity, diversity dynamics is not associated with changes in temperature, at least for canids. And diversity, decline, and extinction dynamics are likely driven by clade competition, in particular with, with, with phthalates. Um, I'm, I think I have a few more minutes. I'm just going to uh, quickly show you something that I think is really interesting. So all of those conclusions I presented to you today. So this is this work has been done. It's not published yet. The work I just presented, but it's on the way to be published. And this, what I'm going to present now is completely new. It's very preliminary, but I think it's rather interesting. Is that all those conclusions that I showed you are based on sort of average behavior, average descriptor, where we we use all this information to build one time series that describe the average competition felt by species. And if you go back to the beginning of the talk, I saw I, I presented you two different ways where people have actually looked into the role of, of species interaction. So some paleontologists have used time series, just the one I, I described you here, uh, which is an average behavior. And some other studies have used trait dependent models where each species is characterized individually. So I thought it would be really cool. What if we could characterize the competition felt by each species individually? Let's say you have the brown species here and you could, you could see oh, which species the brown species coexisted with in space and time. I'm just showing this as a cartoon example here. All the, the, the green species here, for example, this one, the black species here, coexists in time with the brown one, but not in the same place. So it's not supposedly not interfering with the brown with the brown species. And instead of building an average behavior for all the species, we could build a distance or an index for that brown species in particular. So it's the average distance of this brown species to the species which itself coexists with. And we could do that one at a time for every single species. So every single species would have a trait, but the trait here is a trait that can change the value. So it's a trait that describes the crowding effect felt by that species as time went by. Uh, and I could go and on and just showing three, it's a cartoon example of three species for 
three sort of general behavior. This could be increased as time went by, meaning that as time went by for this green species, it became less crowded in the morphospace and in geographical space. This one, there's no difference. And this one, it originates in a place where there's it's less crowded and eventually goes extinct when it's more crowded in morpho and spatial space. So I would expect this to be the, the pattern if interspecific competition is relevant, because I would expect species to more, uh, to, to more often originate in a place uh, less crowded in morpho space, or if they are similar to another species, they don't overlap spatially, because this, this here is taking into account not only morpho space overlap, but, but spatial overlap. And eventually, as different species start to overlap in space and ecology, it goes extinct. So that's, for me, is the expectation I would have if interspecific competition was uh, relevant for us. I'm finishing up, I promise. Um, so here, I'm just showing a few examples for, for those canid, canid species, set, uh, breaking them up into hypercarnivores, mesocarnivores, and hypocarnivores. And you can see that for all the three species shown here, the pattern is there. It typically originates in a less crowded spatial ecological morphic space. And as time goes by, it eventually dies off or goes extinct in a situation where it's more crowded in morphic space and there's a huge overlap in space with other species. Mesocarnivores and hypocarnivores don't have that pattern. And here I'm showing all the species in our data set and the pattern holds true. So there seems to be a robust pattern, meaning that a drop in mid distance seems to be a consistent pattern only for hypercarnivore species. <clears throat> so summary here is that we can build time series that potentially better describe the effect of competition on transcription dynamic, then simply use diversity dependent models, which is what we have been using so far. Uh, when we use this time series, which describes the average behavior, we do see evidence for ecological suppression of interspecific competition during the radiation phase only, not on the other moments in the history of the clade. And uh, perhaps the next step is instead of using an average behavior descriptor, we can actually look at each species individually and describe how it's perceiving uh, competition with respect to spatial and ecological overlap. And I think I'll stop here. I had a bit more, but I had uh, this slide here to remind me it's 40 minutes, 42 minutes, I think. And, and I can stop here, so I don't go over. I do have a few more slides, but I don't want to go over too long. Uh, if that's, if, if, you, if you think this is good, this is a good idea. Because I think it's 40 minutes, right? Of talk. I, uh, I think you're muted, uh, Marcelo, sorry. A classic. No, you can you can go longer if you want. If you have some more slides, that's fine. I have a few more. I just don't want to go like abuse on people. I mean, it's probably seven minutes more. But uh... it's up to you. Yeah, I think it. You can. Okay, go. Mm -hmm. I'll go over it. People. Okay. Okay, I'll go. I'll, I'll promise I'll be fast. Let's go. Sorry for. I try to be not late as the as the bunny here. And, and I just want to turn a little bit into this question. Is extinction age dependent? Which you will see also touched back to the, the role of species interaction. And I, I use this quote by Mike Benton to sort of justify and make this seem like important question. Mike, Mike Benton says, one of the first rules of biodiversity to be investigated concerns lineage age and extinction rate in extinction risk. Are ancient lineages more or less likely to survive the newly emerged lineages? And if this can be resolved, then there will be a, a means to estimate one factor in extinction risk of living taxa. Uh, so the question is similar to when people have asked this question for individuals in different species. Do younger individuals, are, are younger individuals more likely or less likely to, to, to die? Uh, and this has been, I mean, there's a lot of work done on that. And this is all this survivorship curves where we have examples like humans, which supposedly uh, the chance of dying is uh, uh, higher for older than younger uh, individuals. There are some species where it's age independent, meaning that, that pro the probability that a given individual will die, which is this continuous line in the middle here, is independent of the age. And there's some species where the probability of survival is or dying is higher 
for younger individuals. So the idea here is that we can transfer this again to a macroevolutionary scale, and it's not the age of individuals, but the age of species. Do a species go extinct more likely if it's young, if it's old, or it's age independent? And this question was uh, addressed by this amazing evolutionary biologist, Lee Van Valen, which published this paper in 73, with this pompous title, uh, A New Evolutionary Law, where he describes what he calls the law of constant extinction. So he built these survival ship curves, and, and the result was a line, according to Van Valen. And then the interpretation was that the probability of a given lineage to go extinct is not affected by its age, it's independent of its age. Uh, and he, in this paper, he, he proposed a now famous red queen hypothesis to explain uh, the, the law of constant extinction. There were some issues with this. Well, I mean, it's an, a, an amazing paper, and it's, it's a brilliant uh, scientist. But the, what's one, one thing that strikes me was that most of this evidence, and there's good reason for that, it's not picking up on Van Valen, is that uh, this evidence comes from high attacks and not species level analysis. And the reason is because the fossil record is, is more complete if you go up the taxonomic hierarchy. Uh, but we decided to reevaluate uh, the law of constant extinction using ruminants. Uh, and doing that at both the species and the uh, genus level. And what we saw there, this, I mean, first thing was a sort of a, a review of what's there. And there's a lot of evidence for age independent extinction, which was the pattern that Van Valen uh, described. This, this slide here doesn't show all, this, all, the, all the clays. Most of the evidence is age independent extinction, but there's also evidence for young species being more vulnerable or old species being more vulnerable. So there's uh, counter evidence to Van Valen saying that age is an important aspect. For those of you wondering what's the potential mechanism, like for younger species, uh, in, in scenarios where younger species have higher chance of going extinct, typically this is interpreted as a, some sort of demographic effect. Most species start with a small population size, the smaller distribution, and therefore more likely to go extinct. And for the scenarios where older species have higher chance of going extinct, this is typically interpreted in some, some evidence of some sort of evolutionary ratchet mechanism, where there's accumulation of mutations or the evolution of specialization, and eventually the older species become more likely to go extinct. So we approach this by fitting different uh, um, uh, distributions in the case the YBO distribution, and I'm going to go fast here because I'm over time. But trust me, if you fit a YBO distribution, you can look for one of the parameters, the shape parameter. If this is smaller than one, this means extinction decreases with age. If this is around one, this means extinction is independent of age. And if this is higher than one, it means extinction increases with age. And what we found for ruminants is that at the species level, using different sort of sensitive analysis, is typically age dependent. Younger species are more likely to go extinct than older species. When we repeat the analysis at the genus level, which was the level that uh, higher taxonomic level, which most of the studies, including Van Valley, have done, then we don't have evidence for age dependent extinction. So there's the possibility that the law of constant extinction was built uh, and it's dependent on the taxonomic uh, level which we analyze the data. So our ruminant analysis suggests that younger species are more likely to go extinct than older species. Uh, and But when we analyze at the genus level, oops, um, we see no evidence for age uh, to be irrelevant. So it's age independent, which is the pattern that Van Valen recovered when he did this analysis for several, several groups. And this is important to show that there's, uh, there's not necessarily a correspondence between genus and species level dynamics or regimes for extinction with respect to age. And perhaps we might be, it, it might be that the sort of law of constant extinction is dependent on the, on the taxonomic level which you analyze. Promise, almost there. So I just wanna quickly ask the question, are we using the correct pool of species? What do I mean? I mean, there's no correct, wrong or right, but Van Valen, everyone, including ourselves have have used taxonomy or phylogeny to carve out the different groups. We're going to look for evidence of a, the effect of age on extinction. Uh, and, and, and there's one, from the point of view of the Red Queen hypothesis, there's an important uh, aspect here. Let me just quickly read this citation by Liao here. Taxa must constantly evolve to keep up with changes in the environment. 
which explicitly include all the taxa or go extinct. An evolutionary advance in a given environment context by one taxon instantaneously produces a, neg a net negative effect of the same magnitude across other taxa in the same adaptive zone. So in some respect, when we carve out groups to study by taxonomy phylogeny, we have considered this as an adaptive zone. It's not, it's not too bad. I mean, when we, when a, a given mammal family does have some unity with respect to ecology, but perhaps we could do slightly better. Like I'm going to use again the canids as an example. Here we have we could I could test for age-dependent extinction in canids as a role, or different subfamilies of canids, and that would be the sort of traditional way, or the traditional pool of species. But I could also test, and that's what Salatiao has been doing. This is very preliminary. Instead of having a phylogenetic pool of species to the limited adaptive zone, we could have an ecological pool of species. So we could see is the longevity of species when we look at different ecologies saying something different about the probability of extinction with respect to age. And we had this sort of naive hypothesis where we expected hypercarnivores should have a stronger negative age dependent effect than non hypercarnivores. And the idea here, perhaps too naive, was that uh, hyper, species typically start with smaller, with smaller geographical uh, distribution and hypercarnivores typically have smaller number of individuals, so smaller populations, so they would be more prone to demographic effects than known hypercarnivores. And we also had this intuition that uh, for carnivore as a whole, there is evidence for uh, negative age-dependent extinction. And what we find is rather the opposite of what we saw, what we expect. Uh, hypercarnivores have uh, positive age-dependent extinction, meaning that older species have higher chance of going extinct, and non-hypercarnivores do indeed have uh, negative age-dependent extinction, meaning that younger species have higher extinction. So if we partition the pool of species ecologically, that seems to infer rather different results than if you're partitioning them phylogenetically or, uh, or taxonomically with respect to the effect of age in the probability of extinction. And sorry, and with that, I'm going to finish up uh, now, and I'll be more than happy to get questions. Thank you very much, uh, Thiago. Yeah, we have some questions. Um, I'll post them. C can you see yourself now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first question from Yvonne Garçon. Uh, hey, Thiago, long time no see. Thank you for your talk. It is all very interesting. I am curious, what do you ecologists generally think of your uh, of this kind of research. So what do ecologists think about this? So ecologists, I mean, there is, so one, one, one thing that I think I'm trying to do in other people, of course, is that there's very little crosstalk between ecologists and microevolutionary studies and mostly our fault. I think, and there's also on that, on that uh, respect, there's most of microevolutionary studies typically have a very, uh, a very, um, I'm not satisfied. Mean, we we don't really understand the mechanisms, or we don't actually have the mechanism in our analysis. It's very hard. We we basically describing big patterns. So the attempt in 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 this sort of research that I'm presenting here is that to try to bring a little bit more mechanism to the to the to the analysis. Where instead of look at diverse dependence, we are trying to look at uh, at um, and how species are distant from each other in space and ecological in ecological uh, uh, amorphous space, right? That said, I think that's very, it's still very simple for an ecologist's point of view, right? I mean, but the truth of the matter is that uh, it's, this represents one of the first steps to try to, to more explicitly incorporate ecology. So I guess to, to make this long answer, go back to your more direct your questions, that I think some ecologists might look at this, oh, this is very simple ecology which you're doing here. Yes, it is very simple ecology, but this at least it's some ecology that has been lacking from all the microevolutionary studies, I think. Uh, th this, is, this is some of the, of the feedback I get. Others get really excited, oh, this is really cool, we can actually look, because on the other hand, ecology only uh, can only see at a very time window, right? So the truth of the matter is that Perhaps at long timer scales, whatever you measure, it's absolutely irrelevant uh, at the longer time scale. So uh, if you want a hand, you can actually describe and understand ecology in, in greater precision when you have ecological studies. On the other hand, you have, you have no idea what is the effect of that at a deeper time. So I guess that's a, 
So some, some are excited about it because of the temporal scale, which they have no idea or no way of getting anything close to that. And some look at this, oh, this is very simple ecology, right? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, but uh, mostly limited by the kind of data we have. Great. I have some um, additional questions from Susana Magallon. Mm -hmm. So um, it will come in two parts. I have always wondered how diversity dependence among species works. It uh, makes sense as competing populations in a given place and time that are limited uh, by resources. resources. But what would be the limits on species diversification on a global level? Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question too. Uh, both are very good questions. So this, so uh, in a sense, the, the question that Susanna is uh, posing here is it's at the heart of the motivation of what we're trying to do. So people, most paleontologists have looked at global global dynamics, global dynamics, right? And global dynamics is, it's, I mean, it's interesting and perhaps it's, I, I'm sure there's it's, it's value on its own, but the ecological interactions are happening at the space, at a given space, at a given point in time, right? Uh, so I guess it's very hard to talk about global, uh, or try to pin the mechanisms uh, when, we, when we're describing the pattern at a global scale. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the motivation where we're trying to sort of have a more explicit spatial scale, which is closer to where the ecological mechanism is acting, right? Competition is acting at a given place. At a, so that, as I said, there needs to be spatial overlap and uh, ecological or morphological overlap for a competition to make sense or for, for us to better grasp the, the mechanism. So I guess uh, my intuition is that we're not going to get very far uh, at, uh, or, or it's going to need something different to get very far about talking about mechanism if we keep looking at the global level dynamics. It's a different thing uh, because a species that originates in Africa is not going to interfere with the speciation dynamics in South America or in, in, or in, or in, or in North America, right? So I guess uh, part of the problem is that we have been perhaps naively importing every single model from population biology to microevolution without really paying attention to the specifics that we need to pay attention when we're looking at the deeper time level and larger uh, spatial scale. So I think the, the movement now is to go and try to build models like this. And I am saying that this is the best thing. Is, I mean, I'm sure people are going to come with much better ways of doing what I'm presenting here, but it's trying to go at the local scale, have, the, for example, the side dynamics and, and have a sense that the species that actually overlap in space and time, uh, because then you get closer to them. So the, I guess the, part of the bottom is, the point is that we need to have a spatial scale uh, that is more akin to the mechanism, the ecological mechanism, than that simply look at the global dynamics. I mean, there's, as just to finish up, there is, there is, it's, it, it's relevant and important to look at the global scale, but I think that because it, in in one sense, it's a, it's a, uh, biodiversity expresses itself as well at the global scale, but the the mechanisms I think are different than the typical mechanism we are trying to infer. And I think if you try to bring the, those ecological mechanisms, we have to have a more explicit, spatial, more local scale to the analysis, such as this one that I'm trying to present here. Okay, great. Uh, the next question also from Susana Magallon. Given displacements of species through time, has someone measured what happens to phylogenetic diversity? Mm. I, and then she continues. I am thinking about Stephen J. Gold's idea about loss of major life forms and being replaced about more of the same through history of life? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, um, let's see. I don't know the, I mean, the short answer, I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, the long answer, which I had uh, is that people have tried to look into that because what, what I find difficult is that you always need to carve some sort of a hierarchical pool where you're looking at, right? So let's say what we've done is like carnivores. So carnivores, we have, when you look at carnivores as a whole, you see they are stable in number of species. But what's happening within carnivores, there is a huge substitution of clades. So in a sense, it touches what you're asking. I, I haven't measured, explicitly measured phylogenetic diversity through time. That would be interesting to see. But what we clearly see is that clades substitute each other through time. So there is some loss in some, I mean, there's this, so, but I'm, I, so, so in some sense, there is loss of phylogenetic diversity in the sense that huge chunks of the phylogenetic tree are lost through this process, right? I mean, I don't know, there's, there's several families of carnivore that are fully extinct now. They have been substituted by 
uh, more modern families, phallids, candies, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, a chunk of phylogenetic diverse has been lost, and that is a continual process. But I don't know if we if we measure explicitly measure phylogenetic diverse at a given point in time how that how that time series look would look like. Um, there's that said, there's a Kind of remember now. There's a paper by Juan Cantala Piedra uh, and and others in Prop B, which I think would be the best place to look. I think if I got it right, uh, if I remember correctly, they were measuring. They were actually measuring phylogenetic diversity and measuring phylogenetic diversity would be a good predictor of a, of of in the future for predicting species extinction. And it looked like that phylogenetic diversity wasn't a good predictor in the future. Uh, so that would be one place to that I think more closely goes to your question, um, but I don't think people have systematically measured. And we know there's, as I said, there's turnover of clades, and that somehow affects phylogenetic diversity. But cool. Okay, next question. It will also come in three parts because the program doesn't allow me to have okay. long uh, questions. So, what do you think of the use of the fossil record in current comparative phylogenetics? My concern is that uh, there is a lot of uh, lip service uh, to the relevance of including fossils, but there is little understanding of the type and quality of information that the fossil record um, of different groups can provide by users of extent-based phylogenetic comparative method methods. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 so what I think, I think, I mean, I think it's uh, this, great power in the sense of oh you have the fossil record because i think the great thing about the fossil record is that you actually have direct evidence of or speciation of origination and extinction right and so i i see the use of fossils in phylogenetic comparative methods as a, as a good thing in the sense that i think uh, 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 that's we should try to go after uh, that said you're absolutely right with respect uh, in the sense that different different um Groups would have very different qualities in, in, with respect to the with the fossil record, right? And and I don't think that necessarily including fossil record will help uh, unless the fossil record is really good or unless you're really aware of the limitations of the data, right? So I guess uh, I'm uh, you know, I'm excited about the possibility of including fossils because I think there's some there's some process or patterns that I don't think we we'll never be able to recover. Uh, I guess that's my pessimistic uh, perception that we'd never be able to recover from molecular phylogenies, or it would be very hard. Never, it might be too strong, but it would be very hard. Uh, and while for a good fossil record, it might be trivial to recover. Uh, so in that respect, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, from the perspective of the committee, I think it's a good move. But as, as any good move, you have to be aware of the limitation of the data. And I think uh, uh, it might be, it might be true that, I mean, Yes, it's very exciting to include fossil record. For my group, like, let's say someone from my group of interest has no fossil record or has a very bad fossil record, it might be more detrimental than help if you don't have the, 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 the right perception of what data really is. Uh, so I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure if my answer is very good, but uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's exciting that we can include because I do think there are some things that we can only recover from the fossil record or... Or, or it's going to be very hard if you only have like, extent species. Okay. I think with that, we conclude uh, the questions that we had. Uh, muchas gracias, Tiago. No de nada. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope to have you here at UNAM in present. Oh, it'll be a pleasure. And yeah, I just want to thank you again, all, uh, once again, for inviting me. And sorry if I went a little over. Uh, get too excited by this stuff. And if anyone has more questions or, or I don't know, ideas, feel free to to email me. More than happy to to talk about about science. The more science, the better. So, perfect. Uh, feel free to email me if you have questions. Okay. Bueno, con esto concluimos entonces el seminario del día de hoy. Y entonces no duden en escribirle al doctor Quental si tienen eh, dudas adicionales. Y bueno, por aquí terminamos.